Welcome back, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today with Joe Ponapinto and surprise guests, Zach Johnson and Renee Jackson, um, three editors of Orca Literary Journal. Um, thanks to everyone for coming out and watching this video. If you're here um, and you have any questions that arise for you, just type them into the chat and I'll go ahead and work them into the conversation. Um, and if my sound quality gets a little wonky, I might turn my video off. So if you see me coming in and out, that's why. Um, so let's jump right in. Joe, I know you originally through Tahoma Literary Review, um, but it seems like you made yes. some big changes in the past couple of years. Can you tell us like how you got involved with Orca and what sort of led to the sure. thinking there? Well, we... Um... Kelly Davio and Yifen Lai and I did um, Tahoma Literary Review for, I don't know, three or four years. And um, it just got to a point where we wanted to move on to other things. So uh, we were lucky enough to actually sell the journal to a group of writers. And I didn't do anything in that, in, in publishing for a couple of years, but the, the urge was still there. The itch was still, you know, I, I've, I've always been involved in publishing in, in one way or another. I was in the newspaper business and then I had a small business of my own. And so with Orca, I really just wanted to, my, my original plan was just to do something um, kind of below the radar, just a one person operation, just to have a little journal out there. Well, Zach Johnson was in my, um, my writer's group. And when I mentioned it, he said, uh, how do I become a part of this? And I mean, he's such a talented writer and editor that I, there was no way I could say no. And it just kind of grew from there. I mean, people started seeing what we were doing and asking, you know, do you need readers? Do you need editors? Um, that's kind of how we found Renee. Um, she, she actually lives in Argentina and she found us online and said, I, I'd really love to be involved. And she actually has a theater background, which is, we find incredibly valuable in, in assessing um, work and also other aspects of, of uh, what we're doing. So Three years later, we now have a staff of nine people. And, and uh, so, you know, the one person operation idea is completely out the window. Um, and we're just having a blast. We, we, we have, we're getting a lot of submissions. We've got some really talented writers who, who submit to us. And we're, we're pretty proud of the journals that we've been putting out. And we just have a lot of fun. Um, like a lot of other organizations, we communicate on Slack mostly. And um, we just have some great conversations make a lot of jokes. Uh, it really keeps it, it, it we're, you know, it's mostly a volunteer thing. We don't really pay people very much. We give them a little stipend for, for what they do. And, and so we have to, we have to make it fun. And it, it really is. So Can it's you quite fulfilling us, um, at this point. Just to back up a little, tell us about the name, Orca. Um, we were, I have to put it this way, we were fishing around for a name. <laughs> <laughs> and since we, Zach and I both live in the Puget Sound area, um, Orca was one of the things that that popped up. And when when I mentioned it to Zach, he said, that's the one. And we went online and could not believe that it was actually available hmm. to use. So we jumped on it. Nice. I mean, we had, you know, Orcas are very popular here in Puget Sound area. Hmm. And... Um, you know, I mean, they actually exist around the world, but people are very concerned with their welfare here, as are we, and it just seemed like a natural for us. Mm -hmm. um, great. So you guys publish uh, fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Is that right? We do not do poetry. Oh, you don't do poetry. Okay. No. Um, I would be afraid to do poetry, to tell you the truth. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've taken a few poetry classes, but when we did Tahoma, Kelly Davio was our poetry editor. She, this woman knows poetry like you can't mm -hmm. believe. I would not, I would not even want to, it would, it would be almost an insult to her for us to try to do poetry <laughs> um, by ourselves. So we, we don't touch it, but we, we just started doing nonfiction and we, we do a lot of fiction, flash and mm -hmm. short stories. And um, we started about, uh, what was it? A year or two, year and a half ago. Um, we started Getting actually a little story here, if you don't mind. I have a writer um, who had, we published a story of hers in Tahoma. She queried me one day, her name is Rebecca Starks, an uh, incredibly talented writer. And she queried me about a story that was longer than our word limit. And it was sort of a, 
combination of speculative and, but, but really very literary in style. And when I read it, I was just blown away. Of course we published it. And that really started me thinking, okay, we've got the literary genre where you know it's it's about character development and but then there's also speculative which you know one of the things that we look for in submissions is a really good imagination well this story was off the charts imaginative and we just started talking about it what if we tried to combine those two genres you know not to not to say that that you can't publish something speculative in a literary journal or that you can't publish something literary in a speculative journal but we really wanted to focus on bringing those two things together mm -hmm. so Long story short, we now publish two literary speculative issues per year where the focus is on the imagination, but the style still has to be literary. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I still thank Rebecca for, for turning us on to that. Um, so that's one of the things, that's one of the, the areas that we really stress in submissions is that, is that sense of imagination. Mm. Can you define speculative a little bit more? Because I think people have sort of an idea of what it means, but maybe not everybody is completely familiar with it. So um, do you mean ghosts and uh, zombies or do you mean like alternate realities or how do you sort of think about speculative? It, it could be those are um, especially Zach because he's kind of a uh, an expert on that area um, but you know it, it can be those genre elements but it doesn't have to be it's really more about the imagination about possibilities mm. um, you know I mean the the speculative element in the stories could be very subtle it doesn't have to be overt one of the things I was thinking about before we we came online was I actually one of the first writers groups that I was in many years ago was a genre group where they wrote science fiction, horror, fantasy. And it was a little restricting to me because they were so interested. And this is the writers groups. I'm not trying to you know, talk about the industry in general, but they were really, they were really um, interested in, in maintaining the tropes of those yeah. genres. And that's something that I just, had a hard time with. Um, I thought that if you have a, a strong imagination and you could tell a really good story, then why does it have to have uh, an aspect that conforms to some trope? Um, mm -hmm. I, I just don't like to, to restrict writers in that way. And so, you know, really, the the answer to your question, uh, I hate to put it this way, is in our journals. If you if you look at some of the literary speculative issues, we have stories. We have a, a fantastic story in our latest one uh, by a, a writer named um, Sam Asher, and it's kind of a, a. It begins. Let me put it this way: it begins with his father standing on the roof of his house, advertising because in that dystopian future, everything has become advertising. You must sell your life to the corporations, mm -hmm. get up on your roof and talk about products in order to make a living. And you know, it's just so incredibly inventive mm -hmm. that you know, it, it, it's, we just want people to think about things. We want them mm -hmm. to think about possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, because there wasn't much of a definition in there, um, just for anyone who's tuning in and wants to like hear some semblance <laughs> of a definition, um, Anything that's genre is probably going to end up in our speculative issue instead of our literary issue. So, writing horror, second world fantasy, um, if it's fairy tale based, it will probably end up in our speculative issue. Mm. Um, whereas, if it is happening in the real world, think, you know, again, theater background, kitchen sink drama is going to end up in our literary issue, unless there are aliens in your kitchen sink drama. <laughs> and we have found many stories that are sort of on that edge that they could live in either issue. Mm -hmm. And we have some really fun debates about, um, we really want the story, but which issue is it the best fit mm. for? Okay, that's helpful. And so the speculative issue, it comes out once per year. Yeah, and I just, I'll just add uh, kind of the definition that I use for speculative. Oh, sorry, did you lose you, Becky? I'm here, sorry. I just turned my video off for a second because I was getting a little, uh, it seemed like it was freezing for a second. Oh, 
Okay, I was just going to add the the definition that I use for speculative that that kind of helps writers too is um, if you think about uh, Twilight Zone or maybe more current cultural mm -hmm. zeitgeist Black Mirror on BBC, you might tune in to watch an episode and there might be zombies in it, there might be witchcraft mm -hmm. in it, but then there also could be something. What if this small piece of technology was just slightly different? You know, it's kind of mm -hmm. the what if of possibilities. So that's kind of I think where our speculative issues tend to fall is in that Twilight. Okay, great. I'm wondering also hearing you, Joe, talk about that ish, that story with the guy standing on the rooftop and selling <laughs> everything that belongs to the corporation. Do you guys encounter that speculative work has more of an element of social critique or not necessarily? Or is that something you're looking for or not necessarily looking for? Um, really We lost you a little bit on that, but I think you're asking about uh, whether speculative genre has more social justice themes social critique. and whether that's something we're interested in. Yeah, sort of social critique, not necessarily social justice, although that can be a component of it, but um, sort of, because I, I think one really uh, valuable thing about speculative fiction is the way it, it can sort of see the world at large and sort of, you know, these idea of alternate worlds and it, it can have a, a social critique um, current through it. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you have seen that and if that's something you kind of get a kick out of in, in work. Um, actually, I, I would say the literary work that comes in mm. is more focused on social critique. Mm. The, the genre work that comes or the speculative work that comes in is usually more, I mean, there, there's some social social critique but not not a, heck of a lot it's it's usually more um what's a good way to put it i can't think of a, i can't think of a way to describe it but i would say mm -hmm. actually the literary stuff that, mm -hmm. that comes in is is more focused and I, I think that may be connected to our our society right now in general, there is a lot of critique, um, a lot of discussion of social justice. And I think you see that in the literary stories, which tend to want to try to recreate the real world in some way, as opposed to another world or you know, a dystopian or, or other possibilities. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is, is it kind of looks like the opposite to us. Maybe the exception of ecological concerns. Uh, we do get a lot of speculative stories that talk about themes surrounding global warming and, mm -hmm. and pollution. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of whether we're interested in it, I mean, first and foremost, we're interested in this story told very mm -hmm. well. But it cannot be ignored. Um, so I wouldn't say that we're necessarily trying to fill a niche of social critique, mm -hmm. but if you've done it well, and you're going to spark a whole conversation from it. I mean, what what more can you really ask for mm -hmm. in any work of art than than one that's starting a conversation? Sure. Um, so let's go back to the fun stuff. Um, <laughs> Joe, you were talking about the the great fun, the sort of behind the scenes. So can you take us? Um, we writers who don't necessarily know what happens behind the scenes at literary magazines. What what is so fun? Um, what are you guys doing over there? <laughs> How do you um, so uh, Renee, you're in Argentina, and you're so your group is sort of all over the world. How do you make these Zoom meetings, you know, really fun? And um, what what is it that you're sort of enjoying so much in the process? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did mention that we use Slack mostly uh, yeah. um, to communicate. And we have a variety of channels in Slack and some of them are very serious. You know, what are we gonna do in the next issue? Um, you know, let's talk about this story. One of the things that we do is we offer feedback to, to uh, writers and we're, we're very extensive in our feedback. And you know, for nine bucks, you're getting quite a deal. And um, let me, I, I wanna try to put this in, in the most encouraging way possible, but, <laughs> The writing field is open to anyone. You get a keyboard and a business card and you're a writer. And there are a lot of people who haven't necessarily put in um, 
as uh, as uh, Robert Olin Butler likes to put it, the million words. And it kind of shows from time to time. And people make mistakes. I mean, there are writing a, a, a really good, thoughtful, and, and well-developed story is kind of an art. It's something that really needs to be learned. It takes a long time. It takes many years. I mean, I was a journalist for a couple of decades. And when I decided to start writing creatively, I had to start all over again. I mean, it wasn't like, hey, hey I'm a writer. I can just do this. So where we have a lot of fun is noticing people's mistakes from time to time. And, um, you know, it's just a question of, of experience and attention to detail. And so we have a little fun sometimes. I mean, there was one story we got in recently where like the second line of the story was, it was a warm September day. And then two lines later, um, the woman's face was pink because of the cold front. I mean, it's like attention to detail, you know, little things like that. So it, it's something that we, we try to keep those things behind the scenes on Slack, but we have to have some fun. And you know, that was pretty, to us. I would just add uh, for anybody uh, listening right now or listening to the recording later, if you're putting in the work to listen to uh, uh, interviews with journals, you are not among that group that uh, any exactly. journal. <laughs> if you're if you're putting the work in, your your work is standing out. Now maybe you haven't seen a lot of success, or you feel like you get more rejections than you should. I can guarantee you, though, just from a behind the scenes peek, anything that is 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 from a writer who cares every journal is going to take at least a little bit seriously, or at least be relieved that you're giving them a break from what Joe's describing in the slush pile, which is really um, people, they tend to be um, actually not young, inexperienced people. They tend to be people later in life who say, hey, you know, I've had success here. Why don't I just write the next great American novel? But to Joe's point, they haven't put the million words in and it shows. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we do have fun with those, but I would say the vast majority of the writers that we get are, are people like those listening who, who take it very seriously. And, <laughs> and, um, and we have fun with that too. I think even stories that we haven't published, there's... We've got a separate channel just for, uh, it's called Slush Heaven, where <laughs> it's it's just stuff like, hey, you're not even going to publish this story because it just doesn't fit aesthetic or, you know, it, the issue's already full. But this one line I keep thinking about three mm. days later, and then we all get to like gush over that line and our mm. appreciation for that. So I think the love of the language is where a lot of... And on the other side of that coin, we you know, if we see a story that is almost there... Um, you know, where maybe with just a little revision, it could be publishable. We, we let the writer know. We, we're not so big that we can't stop every once in a while and write a personal note to someone and says, you know, your writing is really good. You maybe just want to focus on this or that. And we, we actually do that a lot too. Um, we, we try to be as encouraging as possible, but, you know, we can't do that with everyone. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually one of the most fun things we do is when we do get to interact directly with an author, helping them polish um, and the fact that so many of our readers, in fact, basically everyone at the journal is also a writer. Um, and, and so it's almost like a, a course for us internally that we're curating ourselves, right? Mm. Because there's a lot of discussion about why something was just not quite exactly right or how it could be even better. And who really, who's, who is this their wheelhouse for? And they want to work directly with this author. Mm. Um, and that's like, that's my favorite part. Mm -hmm. So do you provide feedback on all the submissions or is it uh, just, you mentioned the $9, is that like the, for $9 you can you be a pay. trash for feedback? <laughs> um, one of the things that I've learned, that I learned early in life when I started my, my, my graphic arts business uh, many years ago was that um, you have to run any organization as a business, even a, a nonprofit, even one that's not even intended to make money. Um, so we do that, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we sometimes make comments about stories to encourage people, but generally, if you want real criticism, $9 is a pretty good deal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've seen, I've seen everything out there from an extra $3 to $45, you know, I mean, we, we think ours really fits in it. And as it turns out in our, in our feedback, um, generally you either get feedback from two staff members 
or from at least one senior editor. And the, the feedback generally runs between 500 and 1300 words, which is mm -hmm. a lot. Um, fortunately, we, you know, I use dictation on the computer, so I don't have to burn my fingers out. But mm -hmm. we, we get into a lot and we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of resources. In fact, one of our Slack channels is a resource channel. It's just where we've posted articles and blogs and, and uh, other information about literary criticism. So we can refer back to that whenever we need to, to re really reinforce the feedback that we're giving people. It's not just, well, I didn't like it because that's not my kind of story. We, we always try to offer something concrete. You know, here is what um, um, George Saunders says about this aspect of writing. You know, so mm -hmm. it's not really always coming from us. It's coming from people who really know writing and have, have made a success out of it. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, so you have this platform now to communicate with writers that are submitting. Is there... A, a strain that you see coming up again and again that if you could use this chance right now to tell writers like please um please do x <laughs> or please stop doing y or um you know please stop uh starting your stories with a character sitting in a bar and thinking um what, what i will would ask you like my, my co-editors to join me in this chorus <laughs> of Ready, guys? One, two, three, backstory. <laughs> ah, yes. Guilty, guilty. <laughs> the dreaded backstory. Um, backstory has a place in, in fiction, but that place is not necessarily the second paragraph of your story. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see mostly. And it's really just a question of experience. Um, actually, I have a theory about this, and this is another thing that I'm probably going to get in trouble for, but it has to do <laughs> with, with, with our educational system doesn't really have a focus on creativity. It has a focus on these days rote memorization. So what we what I find is that a lot of fiction resembles essay instead mm -hmm. of a story. A topic sentence, background information, a little more background information, and then a conclusion. And that's not the way to write a story. Mm -hmm. What what they don't really teach in school is the art of storytelling. And there is, and that's one of my big beliefs, theories, whatever you want to call it, is that if you want to be, if you're writing for publication, then you have to have your reader in mind. And what are the reader's expectations? What is the reader looking for? Conflict, rising tension, character depth. And those are the aspects of story that especially emerging writers seem to need to still learn more about mm. is how to communicate with your reader, how to create that identification with your character, character sympathy. Why am I rooting for this character? Why do I, why am I reading this story? And, and that's where I think a lot of the work still needs to be done. And, and so that's why we, we point those things out because when you just drop into dry backstory, mm -hmm. your story stops. There's mm -hmm. no forward momentum. It's always looking, it's looking backward. And readers want forward momentum. Mm -hmm. They want to know what happened next, not what happened five years ago. So that that's probably the number one thing that we look out for. Mm -hmm. Renee and Zach, do you second the backstory <laughs> chorus? We can probably give you a, a, another top one each if you wanted, but that's that is the top one that we, mm -hmm. we encourage people mm -hmm. to consider how much of their backstory. It was for their own benefit while writing mm -hmm. and how much of it actually serves the story. Yeah. My own theory, because I struggle with backstory too, and I teach writing and I see a lot of writers sort of getting stuck in backstory. And my theory is that it's actually easier to write because sometimes I see writers and their backstory is actually beautiful. Like it's not bad writing. It just isn't relevant to the story at hand. And there's something about backstory where the stakes feel lower because you're not, there is no rising action in the backstory. It's just filling in detail. So I don't, I think that's, that's my own theory, <laughs> but I like your theory too, Joe, about the, the public school system. But I think um, there's something about backstory that's sort of like, it's so, it's so much more fun and so it's like easier because there's no, there are no that's stakes easy. for the story. You don't have to resolve it. It just ends and then that's it. However, I find I that backstory is distant from the characters because you're writing from this 
from this authorial position. Mm. This happened, and this happened, and then right. that happened. You're not in the character's head when you're doing that. And what I what I always mm. recommend to people is, okay, you need to write that backstory because that's the foundation of your story. But how much of that does the reader need to know to move mm. the story forward? Right. So what you want to do is have your think about your backstory. And I, and I have another thing I want to talk about in a second. <laughs> and then have your characters act as if those things had happened and have mm. created their motivation moving forward so that you wind up leaving a lot of that out. And this is connected to, to using subtext in your story, mm -hmm. which through subtext, through character action and dialogue, it should, sh it should give hints to their motivation. And that motivation is what keeps people interested. What makes this character tick? Why did she make that decision? So what, what happens is you get halfway through the story and you realize, I don't need to put that backstory in. It's right there in the subtext. They're acting in this way because of all the things that happen. If mm -hmm. it's really important, I will get into it. But two thirds of that backstory is just author's notes. You put them aside, they're in your yeah. head and your character acts as if. Mm -hmm. Basically, all authors should read Stanislavski. Mm. <laughs> I was just thinking, yeah, um, I was uh, thinking there, I've heard about actors that write like pages and pages of diary entries for their character. But then, of course, when they're on set, they're not reading from those diary pages. They just have to act with those diary pages sort of baked into the character of who they are. Well, and the playwright has done something similar, right? Mm -hmm. The playwright knows mm -hmm. their characters in and out, but when you right. read that play, you get little hints and that's it. You do not right. have any real context except for what comes out mm -hmm. in dialogue throughout the course of the story. And so it, it clearly does work as a storytelling mechanism. Yeah. When you think about the whole of theater history, um, but when we put it down on the page and the author has full control and doesn't have to let go at any point, right. because writing you know, a story is a much more solitary activity, mm -hmm. it becomes so much harder mm -hmm. to pick what needs to be taken out. And uh, everyone always says, kill your darlings. I, mm -hmm. I prefer to think that you're saving them for another story in the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's especially true about short stories, right? Like I think novels, you sort of expect that and you, you want some of that digression and that kind of deep interiority, but for short stories and particularly short stories online, um, there just isn't the space for that. Right. Um, one other tip that's sort of connected to all of this that I, that I like to um, share with writers is put your work away for a while. When you think it's done, Mm -hmm. And as a former journalist, that was a hard one for me to learn because like you write the story, we're putting it in tomorrow's newspaper. But you write a short story and you think it's great, but what's, where's your perspective? You might even show it to a writer's group and they'll give you some feedback and you might take some of that advice and ignore some of that advice, but it's still not quite done. And we get a lot of submissions that frankly look like I wrote this this morning and I think it's pretty good, so I'm gonna submit it. Mm -hmm. Put it away, close the file, work on something else for a couple of months. I mean, really put your stories away for a few months. You got time. Then when you come back to it, you will have a totally fresh perspective mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you'll be able to possibly see the flaws, you'll be able to see where you could use a little more character depth. You'll be able to see if the logic of the story makes sense from the beginning to the end. Does it, mm -hmm. is, is this a story? Mm -hmm. And I tell you, that's helped me immensely learning to do that. And it took a long time for me to learn to do that. I am a very impatient writer. I, I you know, I write something and I think, oh, this is, you know, this is, you know, the Gettysburg Review is gonna snap this up in a minute. <laughs> and uh, that hasn't happened by the way. <laughs> But Someday. I have found that the longer I, I put a story away and, and come back to it, the better I'm able to re revise and, and make it more clear. Mm -hmm. And I, I really strongly advise people to do that. Just give it time. It's, mm -hmm. it's like wine. You know, you have to let it age and ferment. Mm -hmm. So what makes a story an orca story? Zach, you want to handle that? <laughs> I don't want to put him on the spot. He, he works late, so he's... <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, I think what, what stands out for us is, you know, we all, we all love language. 
And so there are some really imaginative stories that we get, but if the language itself doesn't kind of draw us in with a certain lyricism or an attention to detail, um, then it doesn't feel like us. And mm -hmm. likewise, to the previous point about momentum, we really look for stories with kind of a forward thrust, you know? And if there is a story, we've, we've read some, to, to your point, Becky, we've read some brilliant backstories before, you know, that are just, <laughs> just wonderfully written and everything, but it just doesn't feel like us. We really want something to kind of be stamped immediately on the page. And when we're putting to, together the issue every couple months, we really do think about that. We think a lot about flow and we try to put ourselves in the mind of somebody who's reading this journal cover to cover. I don't know if anybody does that anymore. It, people could just be picking up the journal, reading theirs, and then a couple <laughs> other stories in it. But for those people who might read a journal from back to front, I, I would hope that Orca would read as a, a, a very well-structured kind of literary flow where you... Mm the topics and themes flow into one another and and each story kind of carries its own weight mm -hmm. um i think that's kind of where we go we go from we, we've gotten some really great stories that we've actually passed on just because they if you if we put them in the issue everything would kind of jar to a halt you know the story is so mm -hmm. different from everything else that we're publishing or um, so kind of discordant with that idea of forward momentum mm -hmm. that we love the writing, we praise the author, we let them know that we really respect their work, but it just doesn't work for Orca. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're making those decisions and when, when writers are submitting to different journals, it really is important to read a little bit of what the journal's putting out there because you'll get an idea of if your voice sounds vaguely similar to what they're putting out or mm -hmm. your voice is is so different, you know, maybe don't set yourself up for disappointment because it's just not something that either that journal gets mm -hmm. or it's something that that journal might love, but is not in the publish, the, the practice of publishing. So that's interesting. So do you guys accept work on a rolling basis? And then if there's a piece that you love, but it doesn't fit with what you already have, it sounds like you might turn it down. We have, we've sometimes asked people like, hey, this issue, no, but we're, can you, can we hang on to your submission for a while mm. um, to see if there's a fit for the next issue? Um, but yeah, we, we do occasionally turn people down for just fit of an actual issue. Mm -hmm. And are you guys open year round? At the moment we are, yes. Okay. Um, so can you tell us more about, just for purely selfish reasons, actually, <laughs> I wanted to know more about your writing group, because um, it sounds like you formed a great writing group, um, and you met uh, Zach and Joe, you guys met each other through your writing group, um, and then Renee, were you part of this writing group as well? No, okay, so how, how did you form this writing group? How did, how did you all find each other? Meet up. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I was new to the area. Um, I my wife is a is president and CEO of the United Way here, and uh, you know she's had pretty big jobs uh, around the country. So I basically just follow her. I'm a, I'm a you know I'm a writing bum. What can I tell you? <laughs> and so, so she got the the presidency here, and uh, I moved here. I was like, okay, I'm a writer. Where are the writers? And so I didn't see any writers groups. Uh, so I went on meetup and I put a thing in and starting a writing group and Zach showed up and, um, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know quite, um, we, we kind of hit it off. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we, and so we, we started from there. Um, we, that was, I don't know, four or five years ago. And this was there. when you were also involved with Tahoma Literary Review. I believe I still was. Okay. I can't quite remember the timeline, but I know if if I was, then then um, we we ban we abandoned Tahoma pretty soon after that. Mm. Um, and then you know a few years later, when I started thinking about getting back into publishing, Zach was very interested. Mm -hmm. That's really. And how did Renee come on board? Left field. <laughs> I, uh, I used to be they a... went to Argentina and found you. <laughs> yeah, no. So I used to um, I used to be a literary manager for a theater company in Chicago. Okay. And when I moved out to Argentina, I was really missing working on new work specifically. Mm. So I sort of went hunting for journals that might be open to readers and uh, had a conversation oh, wow. with Zach. Uh, joined as a reader and um, in in far shorter order than they probably should have they let me they let me join them on their 
editorial team. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, but I, I came from a very different background for totally different reasons. Right. Um, and, and it was one I, of I the best decisions it. we ever made. Uh, <laughs> in Valley. No looking back. I, by the way, our, our covers, which we get a lot of compliments on, are all thanks to Renee. She goes out mm. and finds the cover artists. I mean, they're just fantastic stuff. Oh, nice. See, this is really interesting and helpful because I think there are so many writers out there who feel um, sort of disconnected from the literary world, but it sounds like you just put the feelers out there. You put something out on Meetup, which, no offense, but I didn't realize people were still using <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually kind of <laughs> inspiring. Um, and you uh, made connections there. Yeah, um, you know, and I have noticed that too, especially when we do feedback and we get into a little bit of a conversation with a writer and you, mm -hmm. you can you kind of see that a lot of people just have nobody to talk with their, yeah. about their writing. Yeah. And, and I feel really bad about that because, mm -hmm. you know, Writing is one of those things. I can't even talk about it to my wife. She just yeah. doesn't understand what it is to be a writer. So you've got to have a community. You've got to have mm -hmm. people who have the same interest. I mean, I just case in point, yesterday, I got an email from a writer who wanted to submit a story that was a little bit over our word limit. And he did a little synopsis of the story. And part of it was about um, an automaton that develops free will. I just finished reading an extensive article in The Guardian about is free will really a thing or is it just an illusion? Mm -hmm. So I happened to mention that to him and we started to have a conversation. And that's the kind of thing that I love to do. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. we have interests that a lot of people don't share. Mm -hmm. We have to have that, that way of communicating with each other. Sounds like you're Some pretty readers. Sorry, go ahead, Renee. I was just gonna say that several, for anyone listening who's looking for a writing group, several of our readers are also involved in virtual writing groups. Mm. Um, and honestly, like, I can't recommend enough being part of a writing group because even for feedback alone, if you're relying on your friends and family, they're always gonna tell you I love it um, <laughs> because they wanna support you. And, and it's wonderful that they wanna support you, but sometimes, you know, getting involved in a group that's willing to give you a little bit of tough love because they have a similar background um, is extremely, extremely helpful. Sure. Um, it sounds like uh, you guys are pretty responsive to your to people who write in and ask questions. We just had a guest here who was saying she emailed, uh, I think she had a question about a story and you got back to her right away. Um, and Joe, you were just saying you kind of struck up a conversation with someone who emailed about a story. So um, is that a deliberate choice? Is that part of your ethos as a magazine? Or is it just um, it's fun to <laughs> get to yes, know people. For, for two reasons. One is because we are writers and we are a small community and we really need to support each other. And, and two, because it's a business decision. It's mm -hmm. like, responsiveness is so important to any kind of organization it, to, be, to be able to move forward. You want people to say, I trust these guys. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're honest, they're transparent what do we got to hide? You know, we make decisions about work. We base it on literary theory. And outside of that, we just want to try to be nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, I will admit that a lot of the feedback is, as Renee kind of alluded to, is very brutally honest, mm -hmm. but it's always backed up by, by good literary criticism. And some people need to hear it that way. And, and I actually get emails every once in a while from people saying, you know what? I really needed to hear that. I needed to mm. know that. And you know, those are the people that were hopefully helping. My, perhaps my, 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 my most satisfying aspect of being in publishing and editing is when, and this happened at AWP a lot, people come up to me and say, Joe, I took your advice and that story got published. Mm. And that, to be, that is like the, the biggest compliment I can get. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Are you guys open to a writer taking your advice and then resubmitting the same story if they really work on it and sincerely revise it? Absolutely. Yeah. They usually ask and I'll, and I'll say, sure, we'd love to take another look. Oh, you guys are really nice. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen my feedback. <laughs> um, I, I think you know, we're, we're writers mostly. So I think, I right. think that it comes from Joe and I were talking 
I, I won't name the journal, but Joe and I, when we started this up, we were just mentioning where we're, where we're submitting. And, and I was like, you know what? They have held on to a story of mine for three years. Oh, wow. And it was like, oh, I, they've held on to mine for five years. <laughs> and and we, that's just not acceptable. In what right. world? In no other industry is that okay. And I think we've we've allowed that to become the norm with writing. And, mm -hmm. and Joe and I just didn't want to do that. And and we're so lucky that Orca is surrounded by like-minded people. I mean, mm -hmm. Renee is an artist herself, and so she understands how much artists of any discipline put into their work. Mm -hmm. And and we just really mm -hmm. want to be respectful of that. So sure. I I would hope that every journal would have that same ethos. But unfortunately as we all know, they, 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 don't, they don't all have the luxury, I guess, to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's a priority for most of our staff. Most of our staff are still submitting or still writing. They, they're actively on both sides of the equation. You know, they're mm -hmm. reading on our side, but they're submitting elsewhere. Um, and so there's like an understanding of what, what kind of response do you get that you would never want to send to someone? One of mm -hmm. our readers recently over the holiday said, hey, are we sending out not rejections on Thanksgiving Thursday because I know we often do them on Thursdays, but can we can we skip the holiday? Yeah. <laughs> um, because I got a rejection on a holiday and it ruined my day. And so oh. being in it right. lets us try and you know think about what would we want to receive? Mm -hmm. You know, how would we want to receive feedback? That's one of the reasons for the feedback means, right? right. You probably don't want to receive unsolicited feedback. Most mm -hmm. humans don't. And mm -hmm. so even if we wanted to help you, if you didn't ask us for feedback it's our job to just say yes or no and, and mm -hmm. let you go on your way because you didn't ask for our opinion in that mm -hmm. case. Sure. I mean, if people want to get more involved, are you ever looking for more readers? We They're are right now. now. Matter of fact. <laughs> we yes. are. Oh, you are. Oh, great. So how oh, yeah. would someone, would they just drop you an email? Okay. Yeah. If you go to our website, there's a little write-up that talks about, you know, what we're kind of hoping for in a reader and what we offer in return. Um, and you're welcome to uh, reach out via email. And uh, Joe usually handles uh, it from there in terms of you know getting getting people involved, making sure that they uh, that both both parties will be happy with the um, arrangement, so yeah. to speak, because what we I, want people I, to be happy with us. What I used to do when somebody was interested in joining the staff is I would send them two pieces of flash um, to get their their take on it. And you know I I certainly couldn't send a submitter's work so I would send mine without my name on it and of course they would come back you know this is terrible where you know, this mm. is wrong and this is wrong so I stopped doing that <laughs> <laughs> so so I developed a series of questions that seemed to cover the bases a little, mm. a little better <laughs> okay um and have you found that when so you're on both sides you're um submitting you're actively writing and you're also editing have you found that your roles as editors has made it easier for you to get work published? Because I think that's something um, I try to point out a lot in my interviews, because I think many writers feel like there's like an insider club. And if you haven't gotten your MFA at the right place and you haven't made these connections and you haven't said this witty thing on Twitter lately, you're just sort of never going to get into that inner circle, <laughs> where whatever that inner circle means. But um, so I, I like to let people know that it's not necessarily, uh, well, I guess you can talk about your own experience. And I see you shaking your heads. And it seems uh, like it's yeah, not necessarily in my, easier. In my experience, it's actually become tougher to get published. <laughs> oh, really? I don't, know, I don't think that has anything to do with the fact that I work for Orca. But I, I, it's just, um, you know, my, my writing has gone so far in a certain direction that it's just, mm. it's just people want to read, I guess. Um, really getting published is, is a question of submitting, submitting mm -hmm. as much as possible. And Zach can probably talk about that because he writes a lot and submits a lot and gets published a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I think the one thing that has helped being on this side of it, it and, and anybody who would ever want to join us as a reader or another journal as a reader, I think would experience the same benefit. When you, when you see the same thing done wrong 20, 30 times in a sitting through the slush pile, you start to be able to recognize that in your own writing a little bit more too. Um, and so I think, you know, if you talk to a lot of great authors, uh, Joe and I were having a conversation a couple of years ago with Rebecca Mackay, mm -hmm. who was uh, shortlisted for the Pulitzer recently. Mm -hmm. And she's, that was her best advice, right? Was just get in a slush pile, see it done wrong a hundred times because mm -hmm. then you start seeing you do it wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, reading the slush pile definitely has helped as far 
Becky, to your point about the insider thing, I actually leave off that I'm an editor at Orca from any of my submissions. Because um, I have noticed that I, I will get a, a prompt response on my stuff like, hey, I love Orca. We're going to check this out. We're going to, you know, and I almost feel like bad. Like maybe they think that there's an obligation like right. that insider. Hey, fine, I'll look at yours, you know, kind of thing. And um, that sounded wrong. I apologize. Um, <laughs> But um, but it doesn't help with the publishing, you know. It's almost yeah. like it's like a curtain thing, and and so I don't think that that really helps from an insider perspective all mm-hmm. that much. But getting the inside glimpse into what is being submitted and what is getting accepted, I think, is very helpful. And I would mm-hmm. recommend any writer um, try to get into a reading group if they can. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe, you said your writing is so far. Like, is this just? aesthetically you mean your writing is going like in a new direction or is it that you have less time to work on it because of the magazine both Mm. um the magazine and now uh we have just started a book publishing uh endeavor oh Um, with orca well it's actually a separate company okay Um, it's called 55 fathoms which as we learned um, there wasn't an Orca literary journal, but there is an Orca books and it's right mm. over the border in Canada in on uh, Vancouver Island. So I didn't feel I, mean, I probably could have gotten away with it, but I didn't feel right about using the same name. So Zach came up with 55 fathoms, which is the depth to which an Orca can dive. Oh, so, wow! Um, there is a connection there. So that is taking up a lot of my time because um, we've just selected our first two books for publication and there's wow. a lot to do in terms of distribution and marketing mm-hmm, I'm sure. and, and all that stuff. So I am not writing very much these days, mm-hmm. um, but when I do write, it tends to be a little more of what I just, or what we were talking about with the literary speculative, um, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully well written and as imaginative as I can possibly make it. And um, anybody who knows me, I, I have a pretty wild imagination uh, I, I don't look like a writer, but I, you know, up up here, it's, it's <laughs> where it is, and um, so it, it's. I think that's probably, what, and I don't really submit that much these days either because mm. I just don't have the time. And um, so, yeah, you know, if, if something does, I'll let you know. <laughs> How are you guys? Uh, so Zach, you mentioned that people, editors, are responding. They know the magazine. They, they get excited about it. How are you guys marketing? the journal and getting it to readers and uh, other editors? It's mostly our own efforts. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that we're, we're in this for the long haul and we know that it takes quite a while. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of journals out there. We do everything that we can in terms of social media and um, their presence, but we, we don't do advertising and, you know, we're, we, we figure over time, actually our focus is on maybe getting a few awards. We've had several, uh, several selections published in uh, best small fictions in our, in our first couple of years. And uh, one story that we, we had by a Canadian writer um, made it into best Canadian stories uh, mm-hmm. of 2020 and is also going to be included in best Canadian stories of the last 50 years or something as an anthology like that, I believe. So, you know, it, it, it lets writers know that we kind of know what we're doing. And if we can continue to do that, then we feel that more and more and better writers will say, I want to give Orca a chance. Mm-hmm. And that's really all we can ask. I mean, I mean, with Tahoma, we tried a lot of different things to, to market us. And I didn't really see any real return on it. Mm. So when it comes to spending money to get our name out there, I usually say, you know, we don't really have to. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, it hasn't really made much of a difference. We will, we will get where we want to be. It, mm-hmm. it will just take time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it would be remiss not to mention that we are members of CLNP though, which is mm-hmm. the Community of Literary Magazines and Presses. Um, and, and they do really lovely write-ups of what everyone's up to. Oh, okay when we're speaking from from marketing perspective, right? Like we're not sending them ads or anything, but by being members, um, there's a signal boost that that Mm -hmm. I want to give them credit for because they're giving a lot of people attention. Sure. And we learn quite a bit from them too, uh, you know, because there are um, various 
threads and chat rooms where publishers and editors talk about, I have this issue, can anybody give me advice? And so I just, I, I read those all the time because mm -hmm. I'm always learning about this. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's say somebody's watching this video and they're thinking, oh, this is a great magazine. I want to send my work. Are there, um, say they're fiction writers, are there three things that you would want them to ask themselves about their story before sending it to you? Number one, why does this story have to be told? Hmm. You guys want to take two and three? <laughs> Um, number two, is this story accessible to someone outside my head? Mm. Uh, and then I would say number three, um, how much time have I actually put into this story? Mm. We, we see a lot that I, it can't be anything other than a first or second draft. And I don't know any writer who is brilliant or smart enough uh, though they might like you to think that they are, that they can get stuff published on the second or third draft. Mm -hmm. you, you really need to go through a lot of revision. And it shows. You, we can tell when somebody's part of a writer group, when they come, when it comes in, when it's gone through many different itinerations, and it just mm -hmm. is a polished stone by that point. So I would say, yeah, have I put the time in before submitting? So no, uh, no freezing cold, warm September days. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I sure hope that writer doesn't look at this. Podcast. <laughs> I think it's okay. I mean, we all make, we all do things like that. You know, I think um, whoever that writer, you know, we, I, I've certainly done things like that in my own work and you look back and it's like, oh my God, I can't believe I sent that out. That's, that was just not ready. Yeah, and I, you know, it's, there's a sweetness to it because I think when you, first write something you're just so excited you know and you can't mm -hmm. conceive of the idea that somebody else would not be as excited about this project and I, I think that's something um because writers we get so down on ourselves so I think that's actually something to savor you know when you do feel that excited about your own work um but yeah but just you know proofread have somebody else look at it you know um I, I really like that idea that suggestion take time away and come back to it um and, and you'll see what needs to be done. Every once in a while, as sort of an ego check, I will pull out an old story that I maybe wrote 10 or 15 years ago and read a couple of paragraphs and say, okay, you're not as good as you think. <laughs> <laughs> or you're better. I mean, there, right? There are those moments hopefully, where you're like, oh my God, not, wow, yeah. I, I should you know, get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> But if you are listening and you you heard the thing about you know a warm cold day um, and you're you're feeling like panic arise, know that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of stories where Mary halfway through becomes Martha. Um, <laughs> like we make changes as we edit, and that's right. good. It means it means at least that you probably are sending us your second draft and not your first draft because you changed something at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but pay, pay a little bit of attention when you're proofing because it's so easy to gloss over our own there, there so when we many know where the story is going. Involved in creative writing. I mean, we get a, maybe one story a week where the writer has included the track changes at their writer group. Oh no. You know, I was like, attention to detail, people. It's not that hard. Yeah. And, and so yet it is. Of, it is hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard because otherwise, you know, like we're all, we're all human. Mm -hmm. um, and we do understand that, but it, it sends a signal that you're not wanting to send. You know, you're unintentionally saying, I just dashed this off. Uh, even though on a deeper level, we do recognize you probably have gone through and edited it. You, you did not intend to send us your track changes. We've all made a mistake before where you send a dear name email. Um, but it, it does unintentionally bias your reader um, a little well, bit. You know, and you don't want to do that. As, yeah. as editors and readers for a literary journal, we want to feel like what we do is matters to other people, matters to other writers, respected maybe to a certain extent. And so we can't help when the cover letter is addressed to somebody we never heard of. We can't help thinking this writer is just in a hurry. They're mm -hmm. just using that shotgun technique where I'm just gonna send this story out to 30 journals today, I don't care. You know? And so they make those kind of mistakes and that's, the lack of attention to detail that I think bothers me personally is like if I'm going to if I'm going to submit a story and I have made mistakes in cover letters there's no question about that but but I do try 
to go to the, the journal's website, look at their current guidelines, look at their staff, look at, you know, spend 15, 20 minutes on each one so that I have a little feeling for, and maybe I'll say, you know what, the story is not for them. They're mm -hmm. not, they're going to, you know, it's not something they would be interested in. And that's at least the level of respect that I think every journal deserves. So if you're a writer and you're, and you're serious about doing this and about getting published and advancing and making a career out of this, this is part of the game. This is part of the requirements. You have to do this. You can't just send out 30 stories in a day and expect a good response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's respect for the journal. It's also respect for yourself and your own work, right? Like making sure that it's presented well and you're not just um, selling it short. We didn't get much of that, but I think I know oh. what you were asking. Uh, you know, we're actually pretty loose on formatting. If you want to send it in, in uh, you know, it, double space, single space, we don't really care. Courier font kind of bothers me, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> I mean, we really just want it all Comic Sans and at like yeah. thirty-four font. Well, I did know, I did notice um, that you guys have a choose your own adventure story on your site, um, which I think is is really cool. Um, and so it's, everybody should check it out, check out the issue generally, check out Orca Literary Magazine um, and check out that story where it's fun, it's interactive. You can click on it and it'll take you to different sections of the story. Um, and not being a webhead, that was really hard for me to code. It looked hard. It, it looked like it was uh, <laughs> like some, it was, I was, I was glad I wasn't the one that, that had posted so I'm glad it. it worked. Yeah. Um, well, great. Thank you guys so much. So where can people find you um, on Twitter? You're at Orca Lit. Orca Lit, I believe. They don't let me do social media because I just make more trouble. So yeah, uh, I leave that. <laughs> yeah, I think we're yeah. Orca Lit everywhere. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on um, Instagram. That's the where we post the most frequently is on those three platforms. Um, we've got a blog that, uh, while Joe says he doesn't do social media, Joe is the primary writer for the blog, and that will be on our website. <laughs> um, and uh, we're also clearly open to receiving query emails. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And you guys are open for submissions right now, year round, so people can send you their stuff. Um, Our next issue is going to be a literary issue. The next issue that comes out is literary speculative. The next issue that we're currently reading for is a literary issue. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. I, I lost you for a second, but I think I'll um, just wrap this up. Thank you so much.